Hello everyone and thank you for attending today's webinar, Redesigning Services for Families with Complex Needs. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets that you can use. You can expand each widget by clicking on the Maximize icon on the top right of the widget or by dragging the bottom right corner of the widget panel. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the purple Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. We will have Q&A session at the end of the webinar. If you are having any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow Help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. However, you can also submit technical questions through the Q&A widget. Please note, most technical issues can be resolved by pressing F5 or Command plus R on Macs to refresh the player console. At the end of the webcast, you can provide feedback using the survey widget in the widget menu at the bottom of your event console. Finally, an on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that you used to access today's event. Now I'd like to introduce Scott Baumgartner with Mathematica. Scott, you now have the floor. Thanks, Bryce. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Bryce mentioned, my name is Scott Baumgartner, and I'm a researcher with Mathematica and the Deputy De Director of Project Improve. And before I begin, I want to thank OFA for having us today, and most of all, to our presenters who are doing the hard work of designing and enacting programs for our hardest to serve populations. Welcome to the May PRTA webinar on redesigning services for families with complex needs. Many families in the TANF system face multiple and complex challenges to economic security. These include mental health issues and physical disabilities, substance use and limited education, or skills for available jobs. Addressing those individual needs requires an intensive and intentional effort, and it may require going above and beyond the standard suite of workforce services. On today's webinar, you'll hear about how two TANF programs in Ramsey County, Minnesota, and the state of Massachusetts have developed approaches to providing individualized support to customers with significant limitations to work. Comprehensive, intensive approaches such as these feature partnerships with community partners and other agencies. To implement the FAST program, Ramsey County Workforce Services has partnered with a number of community providers skilled in serving individuals with mental health challenges and other significant barriers to economic security. In Massachusetts, the Department of Transitional Assistance has partnered with the State Vocational Rehabilitation Agency to develop Empowering to Employ, an approach to getting individuals with limiting mental and physical disabilities back to work. Our presenters today include representatives from the Ramsey County and Massachusetts TANF programs, as well as their partners. Another thing you'll hear in today's webinar is about the importance of understanding the specific needs and challenges of your customers and developing services that are designed to address them. Both Ramsey County and Massachusetts are using an analytic change framework called Learn, Innovate, Improve, or LI Squared, to design, test, and refine different aspects of their service delivery models. We have some learning objectives for today's webinar. By the end of this session, participants will understand the LI Squared approach as a way to manage change and foster innovation to improve outcomes for families, learn about innovative approaches to serving families with complex needs and help individuals with significant barriers to employment to find work, and to consider how a change management framework like LI Squared can help your program improve services for families with complex needs. Let me start by talking a little bit about Project Improve. Project Improve is an initiative of the Office of Family Assistance to build local capacity to use data and evidence in decision making. Project Improve has three goals. Our first goal is to build the evaluation IQ of state and local TANF agencies. We teach TANF programs how to pilot innovative ideas, collect and analyze data, and refine their program models. We follow the principle of do with, not for, as a way of introducing sustainable change. Second, we provide high quality technical assistance designed to meet participants' needs. We do not use a one size fits all approach. We provide a range of on-site and virtual technical assistance. Third, we want to bubble up the promising practices that state and local programs across the country are using. 
<coughs> After I'm done with my presentation today, you'll hear from two examples of that. Project Improve serves at least 11 programs per year and frequently more than that on a rolling basis. We do not have a focus on any particular populations or type of, of interventions, but we do have contact information at the end of the presentation today if you're interested in learning more. On Project Improve, we use an analytic change framework called LI Squared. LI Squared is a series of replicable, evidence-informed program activities supported by collaboration between TANF program administrators and researchers to design, test, and install program changes. As the name suggests, the focus of Project Improve is on the improved stage, conducting road tests and rapid cycle evaluations to test and refine program innovations. Typically, when programs come to us, they have a problem and a proposed solution in mind. But part of the flexibility of LI Squared is that no matter what point you enter the framework, you can always move backwards and forwards within it. So a program may come to us with an idea to test, but first, we engage in learn activities to understand the program environment and make sure that programs are really ready to implement a new strategy. We may explore existing practices, policies, or program requirements that are likely to get in the way, or uncover other issues that must be addressed to set the stage for intervention. Similarly, after conducting a test, we will look at the results and the feedback that program staff provide and find that we need to do additional innovate work to think through refinements of a program model. There are a number of frameworks and continuous improvement processes to help manage change. You may have heard of Plan, Do, Study, Act, Human-Centered Design, Behavioral Diagnosis and Mapping, or something else. What sets LI Squared apart? First, LI Squared is informed by evidence. LI Squared was developed by Mathematica and ACF, and it is based on the translational science model developed by the Harvard Center on the Developing Child as a way to apply cutting-edge knowledge about brain development, psychology, and brain science to public programs to support healthy child development and improve outcomes for families and children. We use a systematic process. All of the activities in LI Square draw on analytic methods, including implementation science, human-centered design, and rapid cycle evaluation. Co-creation. Installing a program change successfully requires strong engagement and buy-in and builds on expertise from research and from programs. Research and practice wisdom are equally valuable. When we use LI Squared, we are not coming with a pre-designed off-the-rack solution. Even if we draw on some pre-existing intervention, we do not just assume that each part of it works equally well for your program. LI Squared has an emphasis on using and building evidence and explicit efforts to build local capacity to generate that evidence. LI Squared is very much a process about using data to inform decision making. Last, the LI Squared process focuses on implementation and integration to achieve scalability and sustainability in the long run. We guide programs in conducting road tests or short analytic pilots to work out the bugs in a new process before scaling up. One of the motivations behind LI Squared was that we had seen only modest evidence of success of employment programs since the passage of welfare reform. More often than not, the driving reason behind why programs don't see their intended impacts is because they aren't well implemented. Whether there's an issue with fidelity to a program model, or the program has trouble recruiting, or there are other issues that prevent strong implementation. This slide is perhaps most important for our webinar today. People are at the center of LI Squared. LI Squared intentionally takes into consideration the diverse array of human experiences at every stop along the framework. In identifying the problem, exploring new possibilities, and testing and improving strategies, we ask, what works for whom and under what circumstances? So when we are looking to see whether something works or not, we seek to collect a range of perspectives from staff, participants, program leaders, and other stakeholders. And we don't just think about the average outcomes. We push programs to think about exactly who a strategy is working for and who it isn't, and what we can do for those with the most complex challenges. On the next few slides, I'll quickly walk through each part of LI Squared and then turn it over to our state and local partners in Ramsey County and Massachusetts to talk about how they've designed services to meet the needs of some of the hardest to serve participants on their caseloads. 
The objectives of the learn phase are to clarify the motivation and reasons for change and assess the environment's readiness for change. We use a number of strategies rooted in the principles of implementation science and human-centered design to bring the root causes of a problem facing a program to the surface. At the end of the learn phase, we have a common understanding of the motivation for change with a deeper understanding of the problem and its root causes. For example, if a program starts by saying it has an engagement problem, we may move through exploration to pinpointing the place where participants fall off. We also make an assessment of the environment's readiness for change. In other words, to understand what we can build on, what might get in the way, and what needs to be changed in order to move forward. The learn phase is typically followed by the innovate phase. In this phase, we explore and co-create evidence-informed solutions that draw on science, existing research, and practice wisdom. Innovation requires a set of key ingredients time to think, space to try, and safety to fail. The activities of LI Squared are intended to get people thinking outside of their day-to-day -day instead of defaulting to thinking about convention or being risk-averse. It also requires getting the right mix of people in the room, including authority figures and decision makers, seasoned staff with broad institutional knowledge, and those frontline workers who will be charged with implementing the strategies you design. The design process in the Innovate phase involves a series of activities intended to ensure narrative alignment. What this means is to make sure that the strategy a program wants to test is likely to make a difference for the outcomes you want to improve. And conversely, that the outcomes are realistic. The LA squared process is laser focused on the adjacent possible, changes that are one incremental step forward that is both meaningful and achievable. At the end of the innovate phase, you develop a roadmap for change. The roadmap is similar to a logic model, but instead of focusing on a whole program, it is targeted specifically at the strategy that you've developed. It is a detailed plan articulating the strategy, the targets and outcomes, and all of the factors that could help or hinder success. And it is a living guide to your change process and a plan for measuring progress that supports continuous quality improvement. The improve phase involves testing and refining strategies on a small scale. The main objective of improve is to use data for everyday decisions and continuous quality improvement. We determine the conditions for successful implementation and develop concrete guidance for scaling and expansion. What does this look like? Typically, on Project Improve, we guide state and local TANF programs to complete road tests of their innovations. Road tests are an iterative, rapid prototyping process that involves multiple cycles of testing, refining, and strengthening the design and implementation of a strategy prior to scaling. A prototyping process, such as a road test, is literally fixing something out in a real-world environment, seeing what works and doesn't work, fixing the things that need fixing, and trying again. The road test requires the freedom and safety to fail fast. This is a key principle of IMPROVE. By trying something out with a small group of people instead of rolling out something that's untested to an entire program, you limit the impact if it's a bust. And throughout the test, you generate better implementation guidance when you do reach a point of scaling. Improve focuses on building evidence for yourself and evidence for the field. What this means is that by starting small, you develop small e evidence, the information that you need to make decisions. With such a short feedback loop, the purpose of a road test is to strengthen and smooth out the process, work out the bugs, and figure out how to use, adjust to a new mindset. Over time, through iteration and scaling, you can begin to build capital E evidence of success in terms of customer outcomes that your strategy is working and can serve as a model for the field. Before I turn it over to our speakers, I want everyone to consider why they attended today's webinar. We are here to talk about complex service needs, challenging populations who have limitations to employment and economic security that are not easy to solve or do not have a readily apparent solution. So what's a problem that you need to solve? And how might Ally Squared help you think through the problem and identify opportunities for change? Please take a moment to jot down your thoughts in the dialogue.
Now, I'd like to turn it over to Michelle and Andrew from Ramsey County. Thank you, Scott, and thanks for inviting us to share our FAST model with you. Um, hi, my name is Michelle Bellitz, and I work with Ramsey County Workforce Solutions. Workforce Solutions is the administrative entity of TANF programs in Ramsey County. In addition to administering the program, we do provide direct services. And we have a number of community-based partners to help deliver TANF programs in our county. One of those programs is Families Achieving Su Success Today, and my co-presenter is will be Andrew Feeberg of Goodwill Easter Seals. I will be introducing what FAST is, and Andrew will talk more about the day-to-day -day operations of our program. All right, so what is FAST? Uh, FAST is an integrated and, integrated and collaborative intervention and partnership between Ramsey County Workforce Solutions and Goodwill Easter Seals of Minnesota. FAST has been a service model in our county since 2011, and there have been three different iterations of the program since then. In FAST, we're serving families who have reached their 60-month lifetime limit because this caseload is very complex. Families are identified as having a mental illness, a developmental disability, learning disability, or illness or injury, or they may have a child or another family member with one of these documented conditions. In our traditional extension model, caseloads have been very high, and many families have been extended for months. Some families have been extended for months, and in some cases, even years. And we recognize that we needed to do something better. We co, we co locate a multidisciplinary team at Goodwill Easter Seals. This provides a one stop shop where families can receive access to a team of professionals who can increase coordination of services that may have been overlooked or not successful in the past. This allows for employment counselors to have um, smaller caseloads and access to a team of professionals. And at the time of implementation in 2011, FAST was the only known model in TANF that is rooted in evidence-based individual placement and support model. So why FAST? Um, we see racial disparities in our extended families, so we know that our system is not performing as well for families of color, specifically African American and American Indian families. There is a higher concentration of these populations in our extended cases. To put that into context, African Americans are 53% of our extended caseload and 40% of the overall caseload. American Indians are 5% of the extended caseload and only 2.8% and 2.6 of the overall caseload. FAST, um, the FAST team does case consultations weekly, and they include community elders or com cultural consultants that lead in-depth discussions about race and equity and the necessary resources families need in order to ach achieve sustained long-term success. They work on cultural identity development or making reconnections through referring to cultural specific programming. This is a full family approach because one, the second, our highest category of approved extensions is adult mental health, but our second highest category is with children with severe emotional disturbance. This is only one of a handful of programs in Ramsey County where we are serving children too. So we know when children do better, parents can do better and vice versa. This helps us identify gaps in services for families and increases access and coordination of services in a manner that meets the needs of families as opposed to just individuals. As I mentioned, this is integrated programming and it's community-based. Staff are highly mobile and meet families in the community or at their homes, and our FAST site is in the community and not at our county office. Services are co-located and includes a multidisciplinary team of adult and children's mental health, health navigators, our county case managers, career specialists, and cultural consultants. And the IPS model is evidence-based and uses principles of co-location and consumer individualized choice, including tailored employment plans and intensive and comprehensive case management. Now I'll turn it over to Andrew to talk more in depth about the program and its individual components. Great, thank you, Michelle. Um, 
appreciate the opportunity to uh, share a little bit more uh, information. Uh, my my goal is to to talk a little bit more about, uh, from a practical sense, <clears throat> what the day-to-day -day experience is like for um, both our uh, families that we serve in in the FAST program and uh, staff as well. Um, it, it really has been a privilege for Goodwill Easter Seals Minnesota to be uh, a key partner with Ramsey County Workforce Solutions on the FAST program. Um, Goodwill uh, here in Minnesota, uh, we, we, provide, we provide workforce development services uh, for the last 100 years and the opportunity to provide innovative services such as on the FAST program uh, have been, a, been an incredible opportunity for us. Um, and I think, um, as Scott alluded to, people being at the center of uh, some of the, the Improve and LI Squared work, um, we really see people at the center of the FAST program as well. Um, and again, that's both our staff, our collaborative partners, and of course our, our clients as well. Um, the, the program is located uh, at Goodwill Easter Seals, uh, at our, our location in the community, so it's very accessible to, to our clients, um, accessible via public transportation, um, and we really strive to create a, a safe and welcoming environment for all the families uh, that we serve. Um, our program manager is, uh, is embedded uh, directly with the team and provides direct supervision to our career specialists that I'll talk about their role uh, in a couple of minutes, but also provides uh, sort of that overall team leadership and um, support for all of the collaborative uh, partners, as Michelle mentioned, who are uh, embedded. Um, the, the initial experience and engagement for clients, I, I think, is, is really critical. Um, the, and this is uh, the FSS coordinators who really hold the, hold the cases, the referrals from the county for the extension cases go directly to uh, the FSS coordinators and even from that initial uh, interaction. Uh, it's client-centered, it's relationship-focused, uh, as opposed to um, sort of putting the process first, we're putting the, the client and that experience uh, first. Um, we've kind of touched on, on the co-location. Um, I, I, I did want to speak a little bit more to uh, what collaboration, you know, really, really means. Uh, you know, I think everybody uh, on the entire team has embraced um, the, the overarching goal of creating a truly welcoming uh, atmosphere, uh, and that's both uh, from a perspective of the physical space, um, but also from you know the attitude that that everybody <clears throat> everybody takes in in creating a friendly, comfortable, uh, child friendly space, um, art that reflects uh, different cultures. Uh, so the moment that somebody walks into the space. Um, really that what we describe as a hospitality uh, driven customer service is critical to that uh, initial experience and part of the part of what I think really makes the collaboration uh, work um, so again the the FSS coordinator which is the county uh, worker really holds the case uh, and is the the primary conduit as we then initiate referrals to the group of partners that I'll dis discuss in a little bit more depth in a minute. Um, and and those referrals can happen at really at any time. Um, our IPS uh, career specialists um, are are embedded again with, with the team and are looking for those opportunities as are all team members using uh, motiv motivational interviewing techniques to, to keep an eye out for any ambivalence, any um, even passing thought or comment related to, to work and employment, uh, trying to seize that opportunity to engage uh, the client in a discussion about you know how that could turn into uh, a coaching opportunity, a goal, um, uh, even a deeper conversation around uh, entering uh, employment. A lot of the referrals, uh, Michelle mentioned the case consultation. Uh, that is a meeting, uh, a weekly meeting that uh, all uh, staff and all partners attend. Uh, we hold it here on Thursday afternoons, uh, opportunity to 
discuss programming, uh, learn from other uh, community resources, uh, resource folks that come in from the community, and really uh, seek each other's guidance and share expertise across the full uh, array of, of services that are uh, at our disposal in, in the FAST program. Uh, a couple of other kind of essential components that, that we want to share that uh, I think are truly unique that um, are, are so critical in responding to uh, the complex needs that we're seeing. Um, a couple of times a year we hold uh, what we call a family fun night, uh, and that's an opportunity uh, for families to get together in a, a relaxed environment. Staff and partners are present, um, you know, and, and I think families uh, who attend have have gotten comfortable with the program um, and that opportunity to engage uh, themselves with their family uh, in a, a fun, supportive environment uh, has been uh, the, the impacts of that go well beyond just the two days a week, uh, two days in the year that we provide it. Um, but again, I, I think that speaks to the the full family focus uh, in addition to uh, the services to engage uh, children. The um, the oversight committee. Um, I think this is a critical piece of support. Again, um, we we meet every other month, and this is leadership from uh, the various agencies that you know kind of take that longer term view of the program, but also making sure that uh, when we talk about collaboration, that all of our team members, all of our partners, uh, are being supported fully, um, and that um, all the services are uh, are in alignment. <clears throat> So that's just a little bit about the um, kind of the, the overall mindset and the overall approach to the collaborative approach. This next slide um, just provides a, a simple visual of, of some of what I have been describing. Uh, the FSS coordinator, uh, the county worker really being at the center of that. Um, and the idea that we're trying to convey here is that uh, a referral can be made to any point um, any point in the system here that comprises the FAST program. We've, we list the children's mental health component, the adult mental health provider component, our career specialist, and the health navigator. Um, so wherever the need is, wherever um, a particular client may, may uh, wish to start and may need to start, uh, that's where the initial referral is made. And then uh, the collaboration uh, kind of takes hold from there. Um, you know, I, I kind of wanted to point out too that it, it's really important as we we stay attuned to the mental health needs, the physical health needs, the children's needs, uh, the employment needs, uh, every, all of those things taken into consideration. That um, we really want participants to be listened to, heard, responded to. That um, you know, everybody who who walks in the door, whether they have an appointment or not, um, that they're leaving with something of, of value. And that may be a resource, that may be a conversation, that may be you know, a tangible support that we're able, able to provide, but really embracing that mindset uh, as a team uh, has, has been critical in uh, shaping the FAST program. I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes um, and this has been touched on a, a little bit already, but the, the IPS um, practice and, and principles. Um, our Good Release for Seals Minnesota Career Specialists are trained by uh, Minnesota DEED IPS experts. And uh, in the fall of 2018, our program was reviewed and received a mark of good fidelity uh, which we were very proud of, and um, you know, I think speak to the uh, effectiveness of implementing IPS within uh, within the FAST model. Uh, our staff are trained uh, to notice change talk, uh, the ambivalence that I referenced, um, really with that goal of trying to work with our clients to evoke a deeper level of meaning and purpose that that we can connect to, and then uh, coaching participants to reach. Uh, goals that they are defining uh, themselves. Um, then I'll, I'll speak to just a couple of, a couple of these uh, points here as well. Uh, by competitive employment, we mean that participants are not placed in uh, things like sheltered workshops or separate work crews um, or subsidized employment programs. Uh, we're talking about uh, competitive, integrated uh, employment opportunities. Um, 
uh, I think the uh, client preference piece sort of speaks to itself. But uh, with regard to the rapid uh, job search, you know, the notion here is that participants can can work now, and that part of the part of the recovery and the productivity uh, is not waiting, you know, for a certain point of job readiness. Um, but really looking for those opportunities to step into employment uh, quickly um, with uh, time unlimited support, meaning that participants do not lose the opportunity to receive support from a career specialist when their TANF case closes, that, that services can and will persist and continue on. Uh, and then the uh, on-the-job support, I think, um, sort of speaks to, you know, sort of that that robust nature of how our career specialists are trained and implement uh, to be assertive and proactive um, rather than sort of uh, waiting to offer assistance on an as-needed basis uh, as we, as we uh, su support our clients. Um, yeah, I won't spend a lot of time here just uh, giving folks a chance to look at um, sort of the array of, of services that, that our uh, career specialists provide. Um, I think the, the underlying theme here for, for all of these kinds of interactions, be it the preparation or the job search support, um, is really the, the focus on building trust with, with our clients. Um, it's a non-judgmental, non-punitive uh, approach. You know, if someone needs to uh, cancel an appointment or misses an appointment, um, you know, again, we we strive to to be non-judgmental and uh, just really be assertive in uh, in rescheduling, reaching out, and taking those extra steps to uh, in, engage. A uh, lot of frequent check-ins meetings that may take place most frequently in the community, um, in the home, uh, with a truly uh, targeted job development, you know, that, that is trying to align with the client preference with, uh, with those opportunities uh, for employment. And, I, you know, I don't have a lot of time to necessarily give an in-depth discussion of each of the the client, uh, or excuse me, the collaborative partner services that are embedded within FAST. Uh, but uh, again, just keep in mind that you know the, the, I'm gonna gonna flip through the, each of these screens and talk a little bit about it. But the co-located service, the collaborative model, and then um, staff from each of these uh, entities is engaging really frequently with each other, formally during the case consultation and informally, kind of throughout the the ongoing service flow. Um, Adult mental health, you know, it, it really is the, the opportunity to have a full array of everything from diagnostic assessment to uh, uh, therapy opportunities in home, in the community uh, that are informed, uh, that um, we, we lean on our partner, Minnesota Care Partner is the organization uh, that uh, is at the table with us. Um, Next, children's mental health. Uh, Ramsey County, um, in a in a separate uh, department from Workforce Solution, provides uh, a case manager uh, that conducts needs assessments when uh, potential needs are identified for uh, children uh, connected to um, connected to our clients. And again, really bringing that uh, expertise to the families in a very proactive way. Um, uh, Lydia, who, who uh, represents the, the county uh, program in this area, has just done a phenomenal job. Um, and we have recently, just in 2019, added um, a children's mental health uh, social worker that has provided additional capacity to do diagnostic assessment, uh, some light touch case management, and then uh, working to engage uh, children in more intensive services that may include, uh, you know, meeting children in the home, uh, school observations, attending IEP meetings, uh, advocating for families, and providing support during um, hospitalizations as well. Uh, next, the health navigation services, uh, our health navigator, um, assist parents in securing health insurance through MNsure, which is Minnesota's insurance portal. 
Uh, our health navigator also provides assistance with uh, connections to primary care ph physicians and uh, purchasing and providing health-related and hygiene uh, needs, um, some assistance with housing search, uh, which uh, is a barrier that many of our families uh, are facing. Um, and our health navigator also uh, serves as our peer support group uh, facilitator uh, as well. Um, so at this point, uh, having covered sort of the, the service model, I'll turn it back over to Michelle to uh, share a little bit of the outcomes. Yeah, I'm going to try to get through these quickly. Um, so this is outcomes over the last 27 months, uh, current through March of this year. We served 310 people, uh, 151 people were employed. Um, Exited 52 people with employment, um, engaged 299 with multiple services, 75 adults received mental health services, Children, 76 children were served by our social workers, 85 individuals served by healthcare navigators, and 169 people were served by the career specialists, and 51 people enrolled into educational programs. So. You know, it's kind of hard to put that into context with just a bunch of numbers there, but um, right now we don't have a control group for FAST at this time. To help put that into context, they have been pretty consistent with what we've seen with uh, prior FAST outcomes. Um, so that's a, about a 15% increase um, with assessment over other extended cases, um, a 6 to 7% increase in job search engagement, a 4% increase in engagement with education or training, a 14% increase with our social service programs, and about a 7% increase in employment. So as Andrew mentioned, uh, we did recently, just we just expanded uh, our FAST program this year, so we're kind of going through a little bit of onboarding and growing pain still, but um, we're making progress. Um, and we added uh, two um, FSS counselors, um, as Andrew mentioned, children's mental health and another career specialist. Um, we are going to be overlaying our lifelong lear learning initiative, which is a coaching model rooted in executive function skills in our FAST program. And so that's where uh, we just recently met with Mathematica team last week um, to start the LI squared process. Um, they came on to do some design thinking with the teams. Um, they conducted interviews with team members, um, learned about what some of the strengths of the teams are, what are some of the challenges, um, maybe where, can, where we can streamline some of our processes and paperwork. Or paperwork. Um, and then um, we have had extensive experience with, um, with LLI and some of our other programming. Um, so we're going to learn from this process, like what um, from LLI we can embed in FAST um, when, where, and how, what would be the best approach to that to meet the needs of this unique population. And so in the interest of time, we're going to have Andrew take us to the end. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and, and uh, thank you, Michelle. We just, uh, you know, I, I've, as I've alluded to, people really being at the center of, of FAST, and uh, it, it's all about the, the relationships and the trust that we can build with, uh, with the clients that are, are coming to us. I mean, I think uh, it would be easy to, to sort of step back and, you know, kind of, uh, you know, say, well, things have been tried and it hasn't worked. But uh, going that extra mile here, this uh, this quote is from uh, uh, we we do provide clients with the ongoing opportunity to provide uh, feedback, uh, and we we really value their feedback um, uh, in those surveys. And also wanted to just uh, give a little bit of a visual of uh, our space and our team members. Uh, you know, I think. Uh, it, it is about uh, the tools and the efficiency and a lot of the, the evidence-based practices that we use, but um, the mindset and uh, the, the approach and attitude creating that hospitality-driven uh, space is, is so critical uh, to what we provide.
And this, this last slide here is uh, sort of the mix of uh, uh, our Goodwill team members, Ramsey County Workforce Solution team, and um, our collaborative partners as well. So a, a special thank you to uh, all of those organizations uh, that, again, are listed here um, and that I may not have mentioned, but uh, American Indian Family Center, Minnesota Care Partner, Minnesota Community Care, uh, Ramsey County Social Services, and our cultural elder, uh, Mary K. Boyd with uh, MKB and Associates. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle and Andrew. Um, and we can turn now to the team from Massachusetts. Great, thanks, Scott. Uh, this is Amy Kershaw. I'm an Associate Commissioner for Economic Assistance and Employment here at the Massachusetts Department of Transitional Assistance. And I'm very happy to be joined in this presentation by Elise Tibbetts, who's a policy analyst for our economic assistance programs, and also Sarah Maloney, who is an assistant director in one of our local offices in Brockton. So I'm going to walk a little bit through our Empowering to Employ program, which has been an initiative and a partnership between us and our, our rehab agency, our vocational rehab agency, which is called the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission. Uh, I know they're set up somewhat differently in different states here. Um, we are pretty siloed, <laughs> so we have a separate commission um, for voc rehab and separate for deaf and hard of hearing and a separate for blind and visually impaired um, in terms of our overall structure. So this is our, our VOC rehab agency that we're in partnership with. They weren't able to join us today, but they've been an amazing partner in us thinking this through, so I just want to acknowledge that to start. So I'm going to walk through a little bit of who DTA is and what the context is for the change that we're making, a little bit about Empower to Employ, what the structure is, the purpose, and the objectives. And then I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, who can give a little bit more of the local perspective um, about what's actually happening in the local offices, what the, pro what the program is. And then I'm going to ask Elise to step in and talk a little bit about the implementation side, how we've used LI Squared to kind of build innovation from the, from the ground up. And I guess I'll start by saying uh, it was r really awesome to get to hear what's going on in, in Minnesota. You guys are pretty far ahead of us. So for those uh, who are participating in the webinar and just getting started, I think it's a nice um, compliment to see a program that's so well established, like the one in Minnesota, so deeply thought through and figured out in a lot of ways, again, using LI squared. And we're sort of in the, on the early side of it. Uh, we're still kind of in the pilot phase. We've already discovered some really important learnings that make me feel very grateful that we're doing this through an LI squared model where it's not kind of all set in stone before you even get started, that we're trying it in a couple of local places. We're being given the freedom to fail and innovate and succeed and then build on on, on what's working. Um, so um, with that, let me just talk, oh, sorry, a little bit about um, who DTA is. So we are the SNAP and TANF agency um, for, the, for the state of Massachusetts. Um, we oversee not just the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program and the Transitional Aid for Families with Dependent Children, which is what we call our TANF program here. We also have a number of other economic assistance programs for, for elderly, disabled, um, and children. And we, we are a state-administered system, so we have really no counties. We have counties, but they don't mean anything here in Massachusetts, but we're a pretty small state. But we do have local areas or service areas. So we have one central office here in Boston, and then we have 23 local offices. We have about 1,600 staff in those offices. We are very programmatically organized here. So our SNAP, we have, we have a whole set of SNAP, SNAP staff, and we also have separate staff who work on the economic assistance or the TANF side of the house. Um, we administer annually about $1.6 billion in benefits, and we touch about one in every nine um, of the Commonwealth families. In our Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, we serve about 750,000 individuals. 
in about 450,000 households. <clears throat> Our TANF program, which has been on a pretty, like most other states, steady decline um, for a long time. Um, I mean, when we started, when welfare reform started in 1996, I, was, I think we were serving about 110,000 families. Um, and now we're down to about 28,000 across the Commonwealth. And um, not only is that remarkable in, in a lot of ways in its transition, but it also drives a lot of our thinking about who is currently in the caseload and what kind of supports do they need, um, especially when you have an economy that's as good as the one that we have right now. Um, a big piece of the context for our work in Massachusetts has been kind of um, the lowest unemployment rate we've had in a generation, and with that, probably the best opportunity we've had in a generation to really think about uh, folks who've been disconnected for a long time from the workforce or marginalized or underemployed, folks who are on public benefits, folks with disabilities, returning veterans, returning citizens from behind the walls. So a, a lot of folks who have either been underemployed or marginalized for a long time from the economy, you know, we're doing everything we can to help promote those, that those groups have an untapped labor pool. We have employers around the Commonwealth clamoring for new employees or to, for, employee, for current employees to take on more, more hours or take on that new challenge or take on additional training and move forward. So if not now, when? So if we take a really close look at um, our current caseload, you know, a, a lot of folks who've been able to kind of quickly come, come in, get a light touch, falling on, on difficult times, um, and are able to kind of use the springboard of a light touch within our, within our transitional benefit system to launch back into the workforce or into the workforce. Many of those who are still on, T, uh, still on our TANF caseload are those who have much more significant barriers to be able to get into the workplace. And so we've been under probably a now almost three-year um, trans transformation within, within our public benefit system to really be thinking differently. And we've been calling it the ecosystem for change because we, we can't just do one single partnership in a local office. I mean, when we get to this a little bit later, you'll see we are, we, our numbers are very small compared to Minnesota, but we know that they'll get big over time. We are, do, we are making a big difference with this partnership kind of in three offices right now. But if we really want to have kind of a transformative impact on how the system works for people and get kind of away from what, what we had become, which was a benefits processing agency where we held people for some period of time with some stability to actually being a catalyst for change, then we have to be working on kind of multiple levels uh, within our own agency, across the broader system, in engagement with our employers and our workforce system in general, and kind of begin to use every tool that we might have. So a big piece of what we've been doing is is focusing on sort of partnering with other agencies. It started with the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, uh, where we are working with our career centers and engaging with our workforce system in a way we never have before. We have a bunch of purchase services of our own programs that we're looking at in a really different way, pulling in a lot of the principles that you've been talking about in Minnesota. So if we're buying services in the community, whether it's for our young parents, or employment ready programs, you know, we want them to be two generation focused. We want them to be focused on meaningful mm -hmm. career pathways. We want them to be focused on how 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 um, participants can effectively engage um, in, in programs to to permanently exit off of benefits. Um, the other thing we've done is engage more and more effectively with other systems. And then the two things I actually want to focus on today or what this program really focuses on is around um, the, the policy work um, to create these two – sorry. Can you hear that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I agree. Um, there we go. The policy work that it's, that it's created to create these, these two the, – this pilot program with, within our local offices. So we've called this program um, Empowering to Employ, and that's the partnership we have going with our mass rehab agency, our mass vocational rehab agency. And the purpose of it is really to maximize opportunities for DTA clients, especially those with disabilities, to obtain um, the skills 
and opportunities they need to engage in a career pathway and hopefully either exit benefits or reduce their reliance on benefits in order to have a, a much more financially stable future for them and their families while also benefiting from the dignity of work, which is not something the agency is really taken seriously. I think our our view for a long time, at least as far as I can tell, has been to sit down with families who may have some level of disability and whether or not that is um, qualifying them for, for federal assistance or if it's actually a sort of social and emotional, which is a lot of what our clients are experiencing. I think it's been our first line of defense to try and figure out how to get them exempt from having to participate in anything. Um, and I'll just say that it's easier for our staff if those clients are exempt um, because they're not having to see them as much or engage as much. And when you have a really high caseload, I'm not knocking our staff. I'm just saying it's a reality when you have a caseload of 150. Um, having someone who's not work program required or not engaging in an activity. And of course, it's much cheaper, too, because we're not paying for them to be in an employment program. We're not providing them with transportation or childcare. But given the pressures of, a, of an employment scenario and landscape where we need, um, where, where our employers are desperate for new work, and we know many of our clients actually do want to work if they have the opportunity to be given the supports. So as we began working through that ecosystem that I was talking about before, one of the things we realized is that we had a real gap in terms of services for clients who were experiencing kind of mental health or behavioral health, a lot of anxiety and depression, things that might not actually qualify them for um, a long-term disability support, but that were significantly in the way. And we didn't really have the skills or knowledge to be able to engage with those clients. And, and many of the programs that we were buying services from didn't either. Well, our commissioner said, isn't there an agency that does that? <laughs> so we ended up working really closely with our, with our sister agency, um, uh, MRC, to come up with a, with a new program that could kind of put the, the needs that we have um, and the skills and knowledge that they had together into a partnership kind of within what we we're calling kind of within the family. So... Um, I'm going to share some of the objectives of the program, but I, I, I want to pause sort of and say that, um, you know, and, and it's probably true in every state already, of course the Voc Rehab Agency was already serving CP, our, our clients who had disabilities. Um, and they were always supposed to be. If they're eligible, they're eligible. So we would be making referrals to our Voc Rehab Agency and nothing ever seemed to work. So when we finally did a root cause analysis, we realized that, um, our rules for timelines for requirements and engagement um, around workforce were completely in conflict with their process and procedure for eligibility determination and timelines for waiting lists. So just without ever doing anything between the two systems, we, we were setting up our, our clients to fail. So we would send them over and then they would end up getting sanctioned because they, the timeline by which the VOC rehab agency could engage them in services would make them end up being sanctioned on our system. And they were stuck in that bad public sector uh, vortex of poor communication when, you know, the agencies themselves were really hung up on, you're supposed to be serving my clients. We are serving your clients. You're supposed to be serving my clients. And yet nobody, nobody was actually getting served. So one thing we had to do was sort of take a step back and kind of wipe out all that old history and also recognize that both sides had to kind of change the way they did business in order for us to be able to actually work together. So what that meant for us in terms of an objective is that we had to move our whole culture shift from exemption to due to a disability to opportunity. Um, now that's something our Voc Rehab Agency already did very well, but it wasn't really embedded in the culture or the intake process for us. Um, so Working really closely with Mathematica, we also determined that, you know, if we were going to get this started, we could do what we normally do, which is, you know, take 10 smart people here in central office or headquarters or downtown, which are all, all nicknames we have for our central office, and sit in a room and design it for the field, or we could go out to the field and, and ask them and try some things out and let them drive up uh, best practices. Um, in, in, in working with these clients and actually, you know, begin to find people who are really passionate and interested in working specifically with this, this client base. Obviously, our goal 
overall is to sustain engagement of our clients and meaningful employment outcomes. And then to really come up with, we didn't start with a set model. I mean, we sort of had, we, we started with a individualized placement services idea, kind of like Minnesota, where it was an IPS-informed model. Uh, but we left it pretty up, up in the air for the local offices to figure out if there was a better way that they could um, design it. And we're sort of right in the middle of that, that big mess, <laughs> that exciting, happy, joyful mess right now. Um, so I'll say a couple things, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to talk a little bit about how things are working, um, and then Elise can chime in a little bit on the process side of things. But um, here in Massachusetts, one of the things that I think is really important, one one mechanism, one bureaucratic mechanism we we use to formalize partnerships is an interagency service agreement. So somebody ponies up some money, and in this case it was us, Department of Transitional Assistance, and we put together an interagency service agreement, which basically says DTA will do this. We're going to put the money on the table. Um, we're going to give you space in our offices. Uh, we're going to dedicate staff, TANF staff, case managers who are willing to get trained up, invoke, uh, invoke rehab services and policies and procedures, and dedicate them to working with you. And in exchange for our, um, our funding, we expect you, um, Mass Rehab, to hire three vocational counselors um, and uh, one job placement specialist and to put, train them up and sit them in our offices in these three local offices that we selected to be part of this first wave of the pilot um, and to work in partnership with us um, to begin to try and work differently. So obviously, one thing we had to do to, to change that that problem between the systems where we would refer them and they would end up getting sanctioned because they didn't have time to go through the whole rehab, the voc rehab process is we did two things. One is we dedicated staff in the offices so there wouldn't be a waiting list or a procedure or a timeline. And the other thing we did on the TANF side was basically say, instead of having to look at participation, so I don't know how many of you on the phone are, are participating or part of the TANF program, but instead of saying we're going to track your 20 or 30 hours, we're going to say if you're participating as the Vogue Rehab Agency wishes you to participate, you're engaging, you're going to activities, you're going through the assessment process, you're doing what it takes from their perspective to be successfully engaging, we're going to count you as participating and we're not going to sanction you whether it's five hours this week and 40 next week or 30 the, the, the one after that. So at the policy level, we had to put sort of the rules together differently in order, in order to allow the local offices to focus on actually what mattered, which was, like, as Ramsey County was saying, putting the client at the center and figuring out how to set up those procedures. So Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of what it looks like from the office, office level and what kind of services, ha how it's working? And again, you know, we'll recognize we're, we're kind of early on, but, but we're hopeful. Um, sure, Amy. I, I, it was interesting listening to um, the people from Ramsey County because a lot of the core components are really parallel what they're doing, which I think um, is positive for us. Uh, it's very client-centered, relationship-focused, trust-building. Um, the co-location and collaboration has been, um, you know, imperative and really focusing on that non-judgmental mindset and an unconditional and consistent support system. So basically, in the local office, our, our TANF case manager identifies people who would fit, hopefully fit the requirement for mass rehab and she screens all of those clients and really informs them about what the program is, what the process is, what the expectation is um, for commitment on their part, and introduces them to the program. And then she facilitates a meeting with the voc rehab counselor to start the intake process. And it's really seamless because they sit next to each other um, and they talk about each client and what their particular um, you know, roadblocks are and what their needs are, and they work together to get them um, eligible for the Voc Rehab uh, program and to follow up and follow through on the process. Um, a couple of other things that we do, um, 
we have a group meeting once a month, which is um, for the participants. It's really kind of a peer support group where they talk about what uh, their vocational needs are and kind of what things that they, they need from us. And that's really been a positive experience for, for both the clients and the staff. Um, we have almost 100% attendance every single month at those meetings. And um, it helps us to know what's working and what's not working. Um, and Amy spoke a little bit about the individualized engagement. Um, really that participation is really dependent on what each client's situation is at the time and what, what the expectations are um, for engagement uh, for each individualized person. And the case manager and the voc rehab counselor um, collaborate and, and decide together whether the participation is being met. Uh, and if it's not, really kind of follow up with the clients to see what's going on and to see how to re-engage and keep people um, in, in the process, in the program. And at this, at this time, we were almost a year, not quite a year, into the program. Um, and this slide kind of looks at our participation and outcomes. Right now, in, for in-training, um, we and job ready, we have 16 partic participants. We have eight uh, that have been placed in jobs and two in employment outcomes which I believe is 90 days or more in employment. We have 53 participants receiving counseling and guidance, and we've served 124 um, consumers to date. Um, and th of those working, it's an average of about 14.50 per hour and about 30 hours per week that they're working. So it's been slow going, but, um, but definitely, um, it's picked up momentum as time has gone on, and we've realized kind of what works and how to keep people motivated. Um, and I would say the general feeling among the participants is that they really feel supported. Um, they love the program. They love the opportunity to be engaged in something that they feel like um, they have a chance. It's not setting them up for failure. They really have the support services that they need to be able to um, be successful. They're very appreciative of the engagement, the level of engagement of the case manager and the voc rehab counselor. Um, they, they feel very hopeful and motivated. And these are clients that for many, many years, many of them have not been engaged in employment at all. They've been receiving benefits and haven't even, nobody's even ever told them that they might have the ability to work. Um, the co-case management has been a key for successful engagement. Uh, I think that having, having sort of a team approach has, um, has worked well. And clients just, the dignity of employment and the opportunity, um, the opportunities that they have, they really are feeling good about themselves. And I've heard a lot from clients that, um, that the best outcome for them so far is that their kids are proud of them um, and that they're, they're happy to, to be able to be a better role model for their children. Uh, some of the challenges that we've encountered is keeping clients engaged. Um, clients do, in these situations, do have things that come up and crises that happen. So trying to keep them engaged has been a challenge. Um, MRC does require medical documentation for eligibility, so sometimes that can be difficult, uh, especially when there are mental health disabilities. Um, the focus has also been on rapid employment, which is sometimes not um, realistic for clients in these situations uh, when the needs of the whole family have to be addressed, so that, that has been a challenge as well. Um, and I, I already spoke about ensuring that the program is both flexible and holds participants accountable. So the participation part of it, we want to be flexible, but we also want people to do the things that they need to do um, to obtain employment. So finding that balance is sometimes tough. 
Thanks, Sarah. That was great. And I think sometimes hearing, you know, we, one of the things we've been doing as part of the LI Squared effort is to get all of the groups together, like on a quarterly basis for a learning lab. And the last time we were together, it was remarkable. I mean, you know, our commissioners were standing there looking at the numbers and getting a little pale in the face. But um, but those of us who have been participating in the program design and the delivery of the services are pretty um, hopeful and inspired by the impact it's had on, on the clients who've been able to participate and succeed. So, like I said, I, I feel like we're just getting started. Um, so I want to turn it over to, to Elise for a minute to talk a little bit about how we've used the LI Squared process. And we're, again, sort of in the middle of it and using it to, to change. As you know, today we were working on edits <laughs> to our interagency service agreement as we think about building on what we've learned in the last year to change what we do, what we do going forward. Yeah, I think, um, hi, this is Elise. Uh, so through Mathematica's um, LI Square model, we really were able to come together, uh, field staff and executive staff, um, and think about how we wanted to target this population and the different challenges that the field faces in engaging with them um, while we were developing the program. Um, and then through there, we've been able to just make a lot of really quick changes that are addressing the different things that come up. So um, as Sarah spoke about um, before, her uh, DTA case manager noticed that um, clients had feedback they wanted to give and that there was also a benefit to having a somewhat of a cohort model so that they were able to kind of build community where it wasn't a a brick and mortar program that they were attending um, day to day. So as Sarah said, that's shown huge success and the other offices have shown a great interest in developing that for themselves. Um, one of our other changes has been that uh, we started out with the IPS informed model, which really focuses on rapid employment. And one of the things that we've noticed is that because many of um, these individuals have been disengaged from the workforce for so long, um, there is a real benefit to having additional skill building and um, grouping in other uh, program components too, so that we are making it um, as individualized as possible um, to refer to other programs or make sure that they're able to focus on uh, their family's needs or mental health needs first while we still continue to keep them engaged in the initiative. Um, and then, as Amy said, that we're providing forums for all staff to um, provide feedback on how things are going and that we are, you know, almost a year in in providing services, that we're starting to develop our core practice model uh, elements. So um, where we want to still uh, make, to make some actual decisions and then where we still want to kind of learn and try things out um, to move forward. Great. So, just conclude by saying, you know, the concrete pieces of what what we do. We have a we have a state agency group. So each of the local offices has kind of an implementation team that focuses on the things that are most important at the local. How are we working with the client? How are we keeping the client engaged? What supports do the staff need? Where where's my cubicle? <laughs> um, and then up at the state level, we have um, a a state agency team that focuses sort of more on the state level bureaucratic stuff. So what data are we tracking? How are we getting it back out to the offices? So we meet uh, every, uh, you know, every other week to kind of talk about things. And one of the things we've heard loud and clear from the offices is, you know, this rapid job search isn't really going to be, we got into it, we're having a hard time engaging the clients or keeping them engaged. Many of them haven't had work experience for a long time. so. You know, we're shifting the model now to be more of a integrated resource team model, uh, which will require both agencies to kind of dedicate or at least lower caseloads for both both sets of staff. So we're defining what that core, and, and this is something that Mathematica has been really helpful with, and I think given their view from across the country, it's been really clear that you have to have, you have to have an, in, an intentional model about what the services you're delivering if you want to get some outcomes. So if we've really spent the first year, the first 
half a year was really planning and the first year was like trying some things out. And I think going forward, it's going to be a real focus on sort of the clinical model of, of what we'll be delivering and how, and how we do that. We are intending to expand. So early on, we're going to bring on at least one other office. As I told you earlier, we have 20, 22 offices, field offices. We have three participating now. We're going to bring one on early in the next fiscal year, which is after July 1st. And then we're going to bring on two more before uh, the end of this fiscal year, so before next July, and, and hopefully by then we'll we'll reach a tipping point and it'll and it'll spread statewide. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to share our learnings. It's always fun for us to talk about it and to have a time to kind of reflect on on what we've been able to accomplish and and the rest of the mountain that we have to climb. So uh, best of luck to those of you who are going to try and do some of this work as well. Thank you. Thanks, Amy, Annalise, and um, Sarah. At this time, uh, we would encourage you to send any questions that you might have through the Q&A box. Um, and we have a few minutes to, uh, to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, so we have a first question here for Ramsey County. Would you be able to just go back and talk a little bit more about um, adult and child mental health services within your program and what kind of services you're providing? Sure, yep, yeah, we, we'd be happy to, to uh, kind of provide a little bit more detail. Um, as far as the adult mental health services, uh, Minnesota Care Partner is a fully li licensed uh, organization and they provide a, a designated uh, therapist um, on site. So the, the goal is um, if, a, you know, if a diagnostic assessment needs to be done, um, they, can, they can handle that part of things and then also are able to accept referrals uh, to, to their uh, designated staff person for uh, therapy services. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of the, the core thing, and we've, uh, in order to, to facilitate more uh, interaction um, and better integration with uh, partners who might be making the referrals, um, we also, the Minnesota Care Partner provides their staff person with some sort of flexible unscheduled time uh, at about um, eight to ten hours a month um, embedded within within our facility and they're able to then you know meet with potential clients describe services and then um, have that uh, interaction with uh, with partners so we we've seen the benefit of that um, just to create more connection and and uh, uh, more engagement with with services Minnesota Care Partner also uh, does provide uh, arms services and they have an arms worker that um, is available to meet with uh, FAST participants as well. Um, and then I think the, uh, that's, that's kind of the, the service elements from the adult mental health perspective. Um, and the, from regard to children's mental health, um, the, the case manager from, who is assigned from Ramsey County uh, is able to um, provide, again, di diagnostic assessments and uh, building a caseload where uh, she spends a lot of time out of the office uh, connecting uh, with uh, parents and children in a, in a school environment. Um, uh, I think I might have mentioned the, the IEP meetings, but, but really being at the table to help uh, parents uh, understand kind of the processes that are that are unfolding there, and uh, helping advocate for uh, for the kids uh, in in those settings, and then um, the the addition of the of the actual social worker is newer, just in 2019. So we've we've just gotten that off the ground in in the last few months with the idea of providing more intensive services. Um, meaning uh, faster connections to uh, therapy and counseling services for children, more capacity to do diagnostic assessments um, uh, more efficiently as well. Um, and, you know, and that's, that's the one where, you know, I think 
with the volume of families increasing and the number of children connected to those families, um, if, if there's a point in the program model as it stands now where we may see a bottleneck sometimes, it's uh, kind of facilitating from when the diagnostic assessments are done to actually receiving uh, the more intensive services. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're problem solving and kind of working through that uh, at present. But that's a little bit more detail about uh, those services. Great, thank you. Um, and for Massachusetts now, would you be able to speak a little bit more about the impacts that some of these pilots might be having on your work participation rates? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. And um, we, we do everything we can actually not to pay attention to the work participation rate, but the truth is every single person who participates is a benefit. We we have a we have a little gimmick that we use here in Massachusetts, and it's it's um, it's an authorized gimmick, and I think other states use it too. But but we we give a little bit of TANF benefits to working SNAP clients, and we're able to count their um, their work activity towards our work participation rate. So that's one way that we meet it. But um, so in terms of like it putting us over the edge for meeting or not meeting, it hasn't done that. But every single person, you know, who who works, um, whether they're work program required or not, helps up the number. So, you know, if I you know, and, and and I'm blown away by what they're doing in Ramsey County. I'm like wondering what the caseloads are because like I we would love to be able to have staff going to help with IEP meetings. I mean that is ultimately how you're gonna help people not just get jobs, but sustain employment. Um, but you know, if if I were if if I were um, maybe a cutthroat business person, and I were to say you had one employment dollar to spend, and you had to use it to to make sure you you helped your work participation rate as much as possible, um, you know, I don't know that you would pick a, a program like this. It's highly intense. It's expensive, um, but it's what our programs are kind of set out to do. Um, and and if we're moving away from kind of a one size fits all, I feel like we were in a place a few years ago where it was like, oh, you're afraid of blood and you haven't worked. Well, if you want to keep your benefits, I have a phlebotomy program, and you're going to need to go there so you can meet your work your work program requirements, and we can meet our work participation rate. You know, now I think we've been working with the career centers, our American Job Centers, so that you know our more job ready clients can go there. We've been working to, with um, a set of housing programs to create targeted programs for those who are housing insecure or homeless. And now we're working with our Vogue, Vogue Rehab Agency. So on the one hand, I would say, you know, this is this is a highly intense um, and expensive way to try and up your work participation rate. On the other hand, getting clients to the right level of service at the right time is ultimately going to get you better outcomes um, in the long run in terms of sustaining employment and keeping folks from coming back onto the caseload, which is probably more of what the measure we would use for the, for success in this program than seeing a bump in, in work participation rate, because you saw the numbers were, were pretty small. Oh, that's not a great answer, but it's honest. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, we're uh, Ramsey here. I'm, we're really glad to hear your response to that. Um, yeah. That's been our response for some time. Um, I mean, our, our case laws across the county um, in like pre-60 is probably anywhere between 70 to 90. Um, case laws in the FAST program are around 60, but um, as we explained, I mean, we do have a lot of professionals um, supporting those families. Um, and yeah, just really glad, good response to WPR because uh, we took a look at our WPR like years ago and um, our WPR is coming from people that are employed. And if you look at the families that are churning in th through our caseloads, um, you know, we see um, there's certain some segments of our population that um, work just as much, if not more, and meet the WPR, just like you know their counterparts in the program. But um, it's that sustainability of employment and that long-term um, success with like um, leaving um, MFIP with employment and earnings, and um, making sure that families are get being served 
as um, whole families and that meeting the family needs so that they can sustain that employment. So I don't know, just wanted to chime in there and say, yeah, appreciate your response there. Thank you. Yeah. Good. There's two of us. No, there's many, many more. Of us. And, and, and I know that I know that Mathematica and probably everyone on the phone and, and even our federal partners, um, and I don't know if they end up being able to join us, but we've been in many conversations. I mean, a lot of the proposals that the administration has floated and, and that have been around TANF reauthorization are, are broadly uh, cognizant of the failings of the work participation rate in terms of actually meaning something for good, good employment outcomes for, for clients. And I think there's like nearly universal. I mean, we're stuck with it at the moment. So it's how do you how do you meet it without without actually you know creating adverse situations in your system or for clients. But I think there's pretty broad recognition that what we're doing through these two programs are the kind of things that should count. I mean, w one of the one of the proposals that was around there in terms of TANF reauthorization was instead of only counting a 20 or 30 hours, would be counting any hours. And 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 that change in particular is something that I think would be enormously beneficial to a program like this. So for folks who've been disconnected for a long time or have these very significant barriers, need a lot of support to be able to get and maintain employment. I think that kind of change would be uh, would be transformative because it would it would mean our systems were um, you know, unlike what we're doing in Ramsey in Massachusetts, which is paying attention to these folks anyway, I think it would incentivize folks to pay attention to this this population instead of exempting them from something because they're more expensive or harder to work with or however you want to however you want to say it. Thank you. Um, would either program be able to speak a little bit more to um, the cost of uh, the cost per participant and the return on investment with this switch to a more intensive case, case management approach? My, our, our answer will be short. So <laughs> Massachusetts. I mean, so we've invested about $130,000 right now. So right now we're just buying staff. So we're buying those vote counselors who sit in our offices, and then we are dedicating our own our own staff. So right now the the, the cost of doing business is is really staff related. Now, if we were to expand out to some of those amazing professional supports that Minnesota has in place, which would be terrific. Um, it would probably up, up the cost. It's too soon for us to to have a return a return on investment that has primarily been a focus on focus on staff at this point and sort of just the salaries associated with with those staff and otherwise it's embedded just within our our employment programming here. Yeah, and um, yeah, we do, I don't have anything exact on return on investment for you, but I, I mean, it, it is an expensive model to run. <laughs> um, I don't have the exact amount. We were just um, taking a look at that a few weeks back and um, working towards refining that um, because, yeah, there's a lot of staff costs that goes into that. I mean, it's the training, it's the space, it's, I mean, it's, um, so I would say, you know, it might be at least twice the cost of um, some of our other programming. So. Great, thank you. Um, and for either program, um, can you speak a little more to some of the challenges that you faced when engaging the population served by your programs and how you've you know, dealt with some of those challenges and things that you maybe haven't been able to deal with yet? Uh, Sarah, Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about what, what's, what's going on for Katie and Lisa locally? Um, what their challenges have been? Yeah, in terms of the client engagement and, and Elise too, because I know you spent time across mm -hmm. the office. Uh, I, I think basically the biggest thing is that other things come up in clients' lives, especially um, uh, clients that that have a, you know a lot of a lot of barriers and um, who are living in extreme poverty. And I think 
for the most part, they're really engaged and excited to get started, but then something else comes up and kind of redirects their focus. And, um, and it's just having the time really to kind of keep people on track and to address those other things that are going on in their lives. Um, and I think that we're, we're starting to realize that and that maybe other resources are needed to kind of help with that part um, and be able to sustain their engagement. I think one of the um, the ways that some of the uh, vote counselors were addressing the engagement piece um, was that they were uh, kind of meeting they were meeting clients m more often out in the community rather than um, expecting them to make it to the office. So trying to build that trust and relationship in a place where the client was more comfortable um, and also alleviating some of the transportation issue as they kind of got their feet under them um, in working with the program. And I think, too, one other thing um, that has really helped with, with engagement is the longer that the clients ha are working with these specific case managers, with the vote rehab counselor and the case manager, um, the better the engagement has been because the, the trust has been built. Um, just because they miss an appointment or maybe five appointments doesn't mean uh, that we're giving up on them or sanctioning them or, you know, telling them that they can't be involved anymore. Um, we, we just pick back right up where we were and, um, and you know, there's, there's no kind of judgment there. We, we keep going forward if they're able to continue to, to go in, in the direction that they need to go in. But really building those trusting relationships takes time and that's been the most beneficial um, part, you know, most beneficial thing for engagement is the trusting relationship. Great, thank you. And we'll take some time to answer one last question here. Um, so we we're wondering if either program is part of any sort of RCT or any other kind of evaluation out there. Yeah. Yeah, from Ramsey County perspective, um, some of the, Michelle alluded to, there have been a number of iterations of the FAST program dating back for the the last probably seven or eight years and some of the early iterations were um, evaluated in that rigorous uh, random control uh, method. Um, the, the recent iteration is, is not um, and uh, you know I guess defer to uh, you know Ramsey County and resources and priorities there in terms of when that uh, next evaluation may may happen, but I, you know I think it, being creative and sort of like uh, drawing comparisons to some relevant you know the most relevant groups is is sort of where we're at right now. Uh, so in Massachusetts, I mean we're you know um, no, nobody's more <laughs> serious about evaluation than Mathematica, so. You know, basically, we've been working with Mathematica to to try and figure out if there's some 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 way to to connect around evaluation. I, you know, I I said some things uh, that states would want to be warned against, kind of going going down this route because it's expensive. But the, now I'm going to say something really positive about going down this route, which is I think there's an enormous amount of attention from the Social Security Administration from the National Governors Association, from our own corner office, um, from our, our local leadership in Social Security and other places to really be thinking about disability and work, um, whether it's even through the, you know, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. So I, I do feel like even though this is intense and, and expensive, that there's, there is a huge amount of attention both in the research community and in the public sector and policy world around effective work around clients with disabilities and engaging them in, in work. So, you know, we don't we haven't been able to identify evaluation dollars, although 
there, there is a there is a, a a certain level of rigor associated with ELI squared that we haven't typically had in our implementation efforts. So I already feel like we're ahead of the curve in the fact that we're using sort of outside folks to help us think in a really consistent and systematic way about what's working and not working, and and using that to innovate as we go. It's a it's a form of implementation science, but for us it also is a, a form of kind of um, real time evaluation as well. Even if it's not like a a gold standard RCT, at least it's self reflective in a way government doesn't always get to be. Thanks everybody for joining today. Um, we are at our time, so uh, on the slide here we have some contact information if you're interested in learning about Project Improve or have any follow-up questions that you didn't get a chance to ask today. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to my colleague Bryce to close out our webinar. Thank you. So this concludes the webcast for today. Please submit feedback to the presentation team using the survey in your browser window when the event concludes. If you are unable to provide your feedback at this time, you can view the on-demand recording of the event and access the survey widget there. The on-demand will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you following registration. Thank you.